top of my friend list. Um, I think what we'll do is read a passage of Scripture. We'll look at uh, some supporting passages as we go. But I want to preach on something that has been kind of left out of a lot of preaching today. And we'll be in 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 23 And we're going to read 25 verses, so don't get your hopes up of it being too short of a sermon. But I want to do this to set the context for what we're going to talk about. In 2 Kings chapter 23, and verse number 1, we'll begin reading there. And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. And you thought reading 25 verses was going to be a lot. This guy's reading the whole book. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord. This is King Josiah. He was a revivalist king. Made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. I like what's taken place so far in this passage. Here's Here's somebody that's concerned about living for God. He wants to make a covenant with God. He wants the people to make a covenant with God. We're going we're gonna to do what you want, Lord. And from the heart, we're going to do it. This is not superficial. This is not hypocritical. This is not for show. Lord, we're talking to you. And that's the attitude those people had and the king had. Lord, we want to we live for you. Verse 4, And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priest of the second order, and the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal. Baal being the false god. Baal being the idol. And for the grove. And for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without, without Jerusalem, outside of Jerusalem, in the fields of Kidron, and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. That's pretty dramatic, wouldn't you say? Yeah, he's saying, Lord, we're serious about this. And just to show you we're serious, we're going to burn all that stuff associated with the idol. Verse 5, and he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem under the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and stamped it to small powder and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. Hey, this king's serious about getting right with God. He's serious. Verse 7, And he broke down the houses of the Sodomites. He would have been called a hater today, wouldn't he? And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. And he brought all, all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering in of the city of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom. He's still after these idols. Well, he said, the people of God, we've got to get straightened up. You know, we've drifted way too far. And he burned or defiled Topheth. And then the last part of the verse says that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. 
Oh, we made a little progress on that with the Supreme Court recently with the, with the striking down of Roe v. Wade. Verse 11, And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the son at the entering in of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathamelech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs, and burned the chariots of the sun with fire, and the altars that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them down from thence, and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. He's having a spell. This king's, <laughs> this king, ain't, he's not an idolatry, and he doesn't want anybody else idolatrating either. Verse 13, and the, high, and the high places that were before Jerusalem and that were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded for Ashtoreth, another idolatrous uh, deity, the abomination of the Zidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of Ammon, did the king defile. And he break in pieces the images, and cut down the groves, and filled their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel to sin, had made. Both that altar and the high place he broke down, and burned the high place, and stamped it small to powder, and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchres, that were in, there in the mount. And he sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it, polluting the altars of the false gods, and polluted it according to the word of the Lord which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. And that was back a long time ago when that was prophesied and now it's coming to pass at the word of God. What God says does stand. Verse 17, And he said, What title is it that I see? And the men said this, of the city told him, It is the sepulcher of the man of God which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, Let him alone. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the, of the prophet that came out of Samaria. And all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away. And he did them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. And he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars and burned men's bones upon them and returned to Jerusalem. And the king commanded all the people saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged in Israel, nor all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover was holden to the Lord in Jerusalem, moreover the workers with familiar spirits, and the wizards, and the images, and the idols, and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah were in Jerusalem, did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with his, all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. Sounds like he did a good thing for the Lord. Lord, the historian writing for the Lord under the inspiration of the Lord spoke very highly of Josiah. Never had they had a revival like this before. Never did they need one like they needed at that time before. I want to pray and then we'll get into the message. Father, I pray that you'd bless us. May the Spirit of God lead us. And Lord, may our hearts be tender that we might surrender our own hearts as did Josiah and the people of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to speak tonight on a subject that's despised among mainline Christians, evangelicals, contemporary type Christians. It's a Bible truth that causes division. Bible truths do that, you know. 
That can cause division among otherwise faithful believers. This doctrine has split churches. It's busted up preacher fellowships and divided denominations. Families quarrel about it. Preachers avoid it. Critics blame it for the lack of church growth. And most of the discussions about it are negative and sarcastic. Most pulpit committees refuse to follow the, the doctrine and hordes of parents and teenagers flee from it. The doctrine of which I speak is a true biblical doctrine. A true, I want you to make mental note of that. It's a true biblical doctrine. And one of the most orthodox doctrines of Christianity in ages past. It has been promoted, preached, and practiced among true Bible-believing Christians for centuries. It's a doctrine proclaimed by Jesus Christ and his, his disciples, his apostles. <clears throat> the, this doctrine has been held high during the most prominent revivals, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament and in our recent centuries. <clears throat> it was just expected. The great revivals of modern times did not put this doctrine down or did they put it away. This doctrine that we, that we hold to unapologetically in our church constitution at Liberty Baptist Church has been the cause of embarrassment to some who have not believed that separation should be practiced in our day. They have said many times they hope they bring a guest that the preacher won't embarrass them by preaching on the subject. <laughs> People in the community have repeated ridiculous stories that were totally untrue about churches that practice the doctrine of separation. But if it is a Bible doctrine, if it is a Bible doctrine, and I intend to prove that it is, if it is a Bible doctrine, should we be embarrassed by following any Bible doctrine? Why should we be embarrassed or shy about such a doctrine that would be described so clearly and so plainly both in the Old Testament and in the New and has been practiced by the saints of God for centuries. Why would we? In addition to the scripture in the Old Testament, I want to read you one out of the New Testament. Now listen to this. Now if, if you doubt that this is a Bible doctrine, make notes. And if you confront me with it, prove that I misinterpreted or misused the scriptures that I'm using tonight. Because it's not an opinion thing. This is a Bible thing. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Listen carefully. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath unrighteousness with un unrighteousness? What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? devilish beings like the idolatrous practices of those Israelites. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Hey, in the Old Testament they went to a tabernacle and later to a constructed temple because that's where the presence of God was. You know where the presence of God is today? It's in you. If you're a believer, you are the temple of God. And that's what this scripture is saying. For ye are the temple of the living God, as God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, every word in the Bible is there for a reason. <laughs> Wherefore, what I've just said. Wherefore, Come out from among them and be ye S-E-P-A-R-A-T-E. -E. What does that mean? The word separate. What does separate mean? 
Well, it means if I'm standing over here with this group and God says, come out from among them and be ye separate, that means I've got to move over here and separate from that group. Is it true? You know what the scripture is saying? Am I misusing that or twisting it in any way? Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I'll receive you and be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now certainly, let me stop right here. Certainly there have been some wrong-headed fundamentalists, Baptists, and other Christians through the ages who have took separation and made it a test for salvation. That is not what I'm saying. That's not what the Bible is saying. But that just because there's some people that have used separation to beat other Christians over the head with, that doesn't mean that it's to be discarded as a false doctrine. The doctrine of eternal security is a Bible doctrine, but that doesn't mean we have the right to use it as a license to sin. Isn't that true? And so that's a comparison of one Bible doctrine being misused. Just because some people misuse the doctrine of separation to judge whether you're saved or not or whether your heart is right or not. You see, there's some people don't know anything about separation from sin and from sinful practices and sinful alliances. There are some people that are very good Christians in their heart. They've just never been taught. And can you blame somebody? I mean, somebody gets saved. Today, right here, we don't expect them to be a mature Christian that very day, do we? I mean, they probably got some things in their lives that they need to get rid of. Maybe they got to go home and, and cast out the beer from their refrigerator. Maybe they need to go home and get their pill bag out and get rid of the dope. Maybe they need to get that carton of cigarettes out and dump it. Maybe there's a language thing that they haven't corrected yet. But we don't expect them to have all of that straight in their head the first day they get saved. So separation is not something that we use to judge whether somebody's saved or even whether they're right in their heart because we don't know how long they've been saved and what kind of teaching they've had. They may fully intend to live for the Lord and just don't know that they're supposed to be separated Christians. But that doesn't mean we discard the doctrine of separation. And it is a doctrine. It is listed in our church constitution that we endeavor together to live a separated life. Now what's happening today is, is Christianity is becoming watered down. Look on TV. You'll see all kinds of Christian music and Christian action and Christian speeches that are Christian. <laughs> but they're not what they used to be. <laughs> change, some change needs to happen. If it's a biblical change, then let's change it. But just changing things so we can fit in with the culture is not a good change, nor is it a right change, nor is it acceptable with God. <laughs> Separation. Worldliness is what causes, is what results from people not being separated. Somebody can be saved and worldly as the devil. But that doesn't mean it's okay to be worldly as the devil. <laughs> See, Josiah said, look, we've got a bunch of things that's going wrong here. We've got false deities. We've got idols. We're having wrong sacrifices. The word of God has been neglected. It's been laid up in the, in the house of God, and it's, been, it's just been laid aside. Nobody even knows what the word of God says anymore. It's because a lot of times it's because preachers who are cowardly and have no backbone don't preach the word of God because they're afraid that it's going to hurt their church attendance or hurt their offerings or they're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Look, I don't want to hurt the church offerings. I don't want to hurt our attendance. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But I'm a God-called preacher. I believe that with all of my heart. And if I don't preach what's in here, you need to get somebody else. The doctrine of separation. <clears throat> the introduction is most of my sermon. <laughs> the rest of it, we'll look at some scriptures. Like Deuteronomy chapter... 14 and verse number 2. Deuteronomy 14, 2. Make note of it if you don't believe me. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people. Now, I don't mean be weird. Peculiar means set apart 
and you'll be different than the world. Are you listening? You'll be different. When you get saved, you're not going to be like who you used to be. When God comes into your heart, He changes your heart, and you become a new creature. And old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so, hey, getting saved is a serious business. When you got saved, it was implied in your profession of faith that you wanted to be like Jesus. (laughs) And you can't be like Jesus and be like the world. 2 Corinthians, we read that, 6.17, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. That's New Testament. (laughs) That's New Testament. Christianity has lost a good portion of its uniqueness today because we want to fit in with the world. A hundred years from now, nobody's going to care if you looked like, smelled like, acted like, and talked like the world. Nobody's going to care a hundred years from now. But Jesus will care and the people in heaven will care if you're like him. This is temporary life. This is a temporary life we're living. We're pilgrims. We're just passing through. And we need to recognize that this is not our permanent home over here with the world. We're just passing through. But while we're passing through, we need to be over here with the people of God, with the people that reflect the Word of God and the actions of God. And we need to be holy people, a peculiar people, a separated people. You say, but we might not have as many people to feel comfortable in church. (laughs) Is that what God called us to do? Hey, my job as a preacher (laughs) is to Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. If you never get convicted by coming to church, listen to me. If you never get convicted by coming to church and hearing the preaching of the Word of God, if you never get convicted, why are you coming? If you're happy with your life and you've already attained perfection, why would you want to hear any preaching anyway? The preaching is not there to reaffirm over and over again what you already know. The preaching is to bring you from point A to point B. What we shall be, I don't know, but we'll be like Him, whatever that is, when we get to heaven. So we may as well be practicing for eternity's sake. Don't turn me off as some dinosaur, antiquated relic from the 1950s, although I am. (laughs) But base what you're hearing on the Word of God. See, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing much desirable for a preacher to preach on separation. <laughs> you think I get any personal benefit out of it? <laughs> no, it's easier to, pray, to preach on the love of God. It's easier to preach on encouragement. It's easier to reaffirm that the Lord loves you and He has a purpose for you. And some of that needs to be done. It needs to be done. But the Bible instructs the preacher to preach the whole counsel of God. (laughs) And so we can't just, you see, the car we bought. I told somebody we bought a cheap car. There ain't no such thing as a cheap car. (laughs) It's a little car, and it used to be kind of a cheap car, but it's a smaller little SUV type. And as far as cars go right now, it was cheaper than anything else we could find. But it's got some of the high-tech stuff on it, like the blind spot. If you, if you start to pull over and pass somebody on the freeway and there's another car that's pulled up beside you and gotten your blind spot where you don't see them in the mirror, and you don't want to do that beside of an 18-wheeler. <laughs> but somebody in your blind spot and you start to change lanes, that lane, that lane alert, uh, the blind spot alert will beep, 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 and you look over and, boy, there in your mirror, it's, there's a light flashing saying, there's somebody over there, jerk. <laughs> And so you, you pull back over and wait till that car's out of your way before you change lanes. It's also got something called lane assist. And it's, there's a camera up there where the uh, mirror is in the windshield, the rear view mirror. There's a camera up there that, that can see the lines. You know, you got a line on this side. If you're on a freeway, you got a white line here and a white line here. If you're on a single lane road or just a double lane road, I guess I should say, then you've got a, a yellow line over here and a white line over here. But that camera sees those lines. And if you drift too far to one side, you'll get a, an audible alert. Beep, 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 beep. You're on the line. 
dummy. <laughs> and, and so it gently nudges you back. It kind of takes a steering wheel, and then the car will steer itself back to the center of the lane. Now, that's scary when I first used it, because I think, now, who's driving this car, me or you? And, but after you get used to it, it, it doesn't take the steering wheel away from you. You can still over, you can overcome the uh, steering mechanism, but it, it's called lane assist, and it'll pull you back into the center of your lane. You know what the Word of God does? Our culture and our people, individuals, we drift out of the lane, and we get too close to the lane, and the Bible nudges us back over. And that's what preaching does when we're preaching the Word of God. And sometimes it's not a popular subject, but it nudges up and says, hey, you got too far over that way. You can run in the ditch on either side. You can be so stinking separated that nobody likes you. Or you can be so stinking liberal that everybody thinks you're a good guy that's a liberal, but the conservatives don't like you. It's like the Confederate soldier that put on a blue top and a gray bottom, and he got shot from both sides. You don't want to do that, do you? Let me give you my points. First point, <clears throat> follow me quickly as we identify some of these clear aspects of this forgotten doctrine. First place, our prototype for separation. Hey, this goes far beyond just something that we invented on our own. God is our prototype for holiness and for separation from evil, wicked, sinful things. In Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, let me read it. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Now, you get the picture here. Make a mental picture. Here's the Lord. He's high and lifted up. We're toad frogs down here. He's up there. He's high and lifted up. I saw the Lord sitting up upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Twain, with twain covered, he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now listen to this, verse 5. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then he says, One of the seraphims flew over and got a coal of the fire off of the altar and brought it and touched it to Isaiah's tongue and purified him from his sins. He said, Now, I need somebody to go for me. Who will go? Isaiah said, well, I'll go. You know, before we can go and do anything much for the Lord, we need to have a holy life or the desire. To, I'm not talking about perfection. Before we really accomplish anything from the Lord, you know, the Lord won't use real dirty vessels. He likes a clean vessel. I grew up in the, in the 50s. <laughs> and we come in from... All in hay, and we'd all go in. There's one big old galvanized bucket there where everybody would dip the same dipper in the bucket and get them a big drink of water, and we are starving to death, and it tasted good. But the next guy that took a drink, he would be dipping snuff, and it's running down his chin. He's doing the same dipper as everybody else. Some guy didn't have any teeth, and his teeth are rotted out, and he's drinking out of the same dipper. <laughs> and we're just all drinking out of the same bucket, same dipper. Wash pan sitting there, we wash our hands. The last guy to wash his hands really got in some dingy water. You know what? I don't like to do that anymore. I kind of like to have my own glass. A clean one. Have you ever, ever been eating at a restaurant and you get a plate or a piece of silverware and it's got an egg yolk caked up on it? <laughs> I have. I don't want to eat off of it. Neither does God use, like to use dirty vessels. We can't be perfect, but we can be cleaner. Our understanding of separation begins with a picture of God being a holy God. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. Is that not what the scripture says? 
So our beginning of understanding the doctrine of separation begins with God himself. He is holy. Can anybody dispute that? Does he expect us to be holy? Can anybody deny that that's in the word of God? So our beginning thoughts about this begins with divine majesty and purity. Notice a second element of separation. Listen, it's our positional separation. Now, when you got saved, you got set apart from the world with the believers. Positionally, you're in Christ. Now, you can look at yourself and say, I don't look like I'm in Jesus. Well, you are if you got saved. You're in Him and He's in you. He said, I'll not leave you comfortless, but I will send another comforter. And He came as the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God, when you believed and He lives within you. He needs a clean house. We're practically, positionally set apart. 2 Peter 2.9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, New Testament, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If he cleans you, then you ought to look clean. Yeah. When you accepted Christ, you had some idea that he wanted you to be different. Otherwise, why, did you, why were you interested in being saved? He saved you. He wants to change you. Then our practical separation, this is where the rubber meets the road. Our practical separation is where, where people see what we're doing. We act out our salvation. Our holiness, our separated life, shows in a personal way. It, env- it envisions a life that is set apart for God. A life that is clean. Now how can people see if your life is clean? Can they see your heart? Can people see your heart? Can people see your heart? Yes or no? No. Only God sees the heart. He looks on the heart. What does everybody else look on? The outward appearance. That's all anybody else can see. So can you look at somebody outwardly and tell if they're saved or not? No, but you can see if they're acting out their salvation. And it's oftentimes what's under the hood that counts. Remember that? (laughs) When Daniel was carried away with the children of Israel into Babylon, he refused the king's wine and food. He said, give us pulse to eat and water to drink. We don't want the king's stuff. Why did he do that? Wouldn't, that, wouldn't the king's food have been pretty good? <laughs> I suppose it had been better than a bowl of beans. Maybe, although beans are pretty good. So why did he refuse that? It was unclean to the Jewish people. And even though he was in Babylon, he didn't want to be identified with Babylon. He wanted to be identified with the people of God over here who were living according to the law of God. And he said, keep the food and wine, not interested. We believe God's going to take care of us. Oh, wow. What do we call that? Faith. (laughs) Your clothing, or lack of it, says a lot about your Christianity. One of the commercials on TV kind of irks me. I know it's about a skin disease, and I understand that, but the words that they use just kind of irks me. So, hide my skin? Not me. (laughs) Well, I think a lot of Christians are the same way. The world says, show your skin. And the Christian says, well, should I hide my skin? No, not me. (laughs) It's like the more skin you show, the more you're accepted in the world. Do you know there's such a thing as modesty in the Bible? (laughs) And men and women both ought to be modest. There is a clothing. Listen, let, let me take you back in our own culture just a little ways. We didn't always have men who thought they could get pregnant. We didn't always have men who thought that men ought to be married to each other. But I remember back when jokingly on TV there would be some comedian that would come out with a dress on. 
And everybody laughed and hoorahed and applauded. And, That's funny. That's funny. But it went a little further. And then finally people got to thinking, well, why can't a man wear a dress? <laughs> and so they began to wear dresses. Sometimes just, and they became drag queens. And then some men began to wear dresses because this is style, man. <laughs> We've come a long way in the wrong direction. There is a clothing that's appropriate for a man and a clothing appropriate for a woman. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And if you've seen these old-fashioned shades, the cheap roll-up shades, it's made of kind of a canvas-looking stuff. You can pull one of those shades, and uh, if you've got the light on in your room, you could actually stand in front of that shade, and nobody could see your skin. And they couldn't see your form perfectly, but they can see a silhouette of your body. This is Brooks' theology here. This is not in the Bible. I'm just telling you what I think. Since God created them male and female, and he did say that there was a clothing in Deuteronomy 22, 6, he said that, that a man shouldn't put on a woman's garment and a woman shouldn't put on a man's garment. <laughs> I'm struggling here. Um, there is such a thing as a man's garment and a woman's garment, and they're not to be interchanged. And if, if you were standing, and, and, and in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, it says a woman's hair was given to her for glory. But if a man hath long hair, it's a shame to him. Now the scripture says that. Look it up if you think I'm lying to you. So there is a garment that a man's supposed to wear and a garment that a woman's supposed to go. Now you can, go, you can argue about robes all you want to, but there is a different garment for a man and a different gar garment for a woman. And there is a hairstyle for a man and a hairstyle for a woman. You say, how short is short? I don't know, but the Bible says there's a difference. They're short and long because a woman's supposed to have long hair and a man's supposed to have short hair. So here's my point, getting back to my illustration. You could go and stand in front of that shade that's been pulled with a light in the background. Somebody on the other side of that shade ought to be able to tell if you're a man or a woman by that silhouette on the shade. Now, that's, that's my way of thinking. Can't prove it in the Bible, but I think it makes good sense. I mean, if your hair is short enough, it ought to say, that's a man. Or if it's long flowing hair, it ought to say, that's a woman. And your clothing ought to do that as well. They put those little emblems on restroom doors. We don't have any trouble interpreting those. <laughs> oh, now, preacher, you're meddling. Okay, I'm, I guess I'll apologize if you come to me after church. <laughs> but right now, I'm just going to go ahead and preach it. We're supposed to come out from among them and be separate. It seems to me that churches are more worldly than they've ever been. Do you know what the church of Laodicea was like in Revelation? Lukewarm. I ordered Roby's, uh, Roby's, Arby's roast beef French dip sandwich in Batesville today. They gave me my sandwich and the au jus was lukewarm. I took it back. I said, can you heat that up? Man, that's... Not even quite room temperature. <laughs> it's so cold. He said, we don't have any way to heat it up. I said, well, can you give me some more that's already hot? He said, we don't have any other way to give it. It comes out of the pot. They had something that looked like a coffee pot there. He said, comes out of the pot just like that. That's the best we can do. And he turned and walked away. <laughs> so I had to eat lukewarm gravy. The Laodicean church in Revelation was lukewarm. And Jesus said, when you're lukewarm, it makes me want to spew you out of my mouth. I think the Lord doesn't like lukewarm gravy either. <laughs> and the church in Laodicea was a very worldly church. And I think we live in an age that is very worldly. Very Laodicean-like. It takes a little courage sometimes to buck the system. But when churches get so worldly that they look just like the world, why do they exist? Do we have anything different to offer those who are wandering in darkness? Do we need to drink the same suds they're drinking? Do we need to take the pill, same pills and smoke the same dope that they're doing? Do we need to wear the same immodest clothing that they wear? Do we need to speak the same worldly language that they speak. I think a church that's a biblical church 
it ought to be evident without having to strain too hard just to look at the congregation and say, that church is different than the world. There's, a, there's personal separation. We're supposed to be personally separated. As a Christian, I ought to be personally separated. When my wife got saved, she got saved three years before I did. I was still living like a heathen for a pretty good while, but she was going to church here and some good preaching. She got under conviction because uh, the clothing she was wearing was not very modest. And she came home one day and went through all of the dresser drawers and threw out all of what she perceived to be immodest clothing. That was over 40 years ago, and she's never bought those clothes again. So is she a prude? I think she's pretty pretty. You better not say anything different. <laughs> she looks pretty pretty to me, and she looks pretty feminine. She doesn't dress like a man. I don't dress like a woman, I, I hope. <laughs> if you ever catch me dressing like a woman, get a new pastor. But there's personal separation. And then there's ecclesiastical separation. You say, well, what's that? Ecclesiastical separation is a separation of, of worldly churches from biblical churches. In other words, if we're going to be biblically ecclesiastically separated that means that I ought not to have uh, Dr. Smell Fungus from over at uh, the first liberal church come over and preach for us if he's a flaming liberal who denies the, the, the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord I'm not having him if, he, if he's a very worldly type of Christian I'm not having him uh, the Southern Baptist Convention has been fighting a battle for decades to try to keep worldliness and apostasy out of the convention. Adrian Rogers was one of those who battled for conservative Christianity. And I thought back then, I admire his, uh, I admire his uh, backbone for trying, but I don't think he's going to win, and he didn't. The Southern Baptist Convention is more worldly than it's ever been before. That's why I'm an independent Baptist. We're not linked together as independent Baptists. We are independent. <laughs> that means that if there's another independent church across town, they can do whatever they want to, but we're not going to do exactly like them if they're not doing something biblical. We're not accountable for them. But when you join up hand in hand with an organization that is known for its apostasy, its denial of the Word of God, its worldly looks and actions when they start ordaining homosexuals into the ministry, I don't want to be part of that group. If lightning strikes, I don't want to be anywhere close. <laughs> I'm saying we ought to be ecclesiastically separated. That's, we can cooperate with churches of like faith. We can go to their revivals. They can come to ours. I think you ought to be loyal to your own church. Whenever your own church is having service, I think you ought to be in that one. But if they're having a special meeting on a Tuesday night or a Thursday night or over the weekend, not on Sunday, and you go to an, I'm not like a preacher I had once, man. He didn't want his congregation going anywhere, anytime to any other church. I don't feel that way about it. I just think when we're having services, people ought to attend their own church. And don't get caught in that trap. Of, you come to my church this Sunday and I'll go to your church next Sunday. <laughs> That's a trap. Be loyal to your own church. And be ecclesiastically separated. We don't want our church linked up with those who are openly liberal, unbelieving, apostate, worldly. J. Frank Norris, John R. Rice, Lee Robertson, Lester Roloff, and a whole host of other independent Baptist preachers became independent because they got kicked out of associations and conventions <laughs> because they didn't want to be linked up with worldliness and apostasy. That's not being self-righteous. That's being separated. Well, I see my time is about gone. And I had uh, a poem to read. But I know you, I know you love poems, don't you? <laughs> I'll skip the poem. Let me give you number four. I've got to give you this one. We've got to end on a, on a note where you're not mad at me anymore. Our positive separation. Separation is a positive. 
Some people say, well, that's, being separated is just very, very negative. No. Leaving a worldly association, joining with a conservative Bible-believing association is not totally negative. There is a negative side to it, but there's a positive side. It's like when you choose to follow Christ and say no to the world. It's negative to say no to the world, but that's a negative that's good. But we're not supposed to just turn from something, but we're supposed to turn to something. We turn from the world to Christ. There is no virtue in just being separated if you don't turn to Christ. You can, be, you can be totally separated, have a good haircut, wear the right clothing and say the right words and you can be lost as a goose. But if you're saved, you ought to want to look that way. <laughs> Hello, I said if you're saved, you ought to look that way, talk that way, smell that way. Our positive separation, we're separated to something. I heard one preacher say, you can't love your garden properly if you don't hate weeds. You can't love weeds in the same way you love your garden or you're not going to have much of a garden. If you've got a garden, you're growing some, you're growing some purple hull peas. <laughs> if you don't keep those weeds out, your purple hull peas are not going to do well. And if you're a Christian, there are some weeds of the devil that tries to creep into your life and you've got to pull them and toss them out. A separation. A garden is separated. And a Christian ought to be separated. I'm not talking about becoming isolated. Did you hear that? I'm not talking about becoming isolated where we don't, we're, we're holier than thou and, and we're just too good to associate with anybody else. I'm not talking about that at all. You see, the world still needs a witness. And that's where holy separated people leave this group. You're not over here drinking booze and taking drugs and cussing and telling dirty jokes with that group, but you're over here with this group that identifies with the things of the Bible and the things of Christ, and then you can go ring their doorbell and witness to them. You can have them over to your house for supper and tell them about the Lord. You can be friends with your next door neighbor who's an unbeliever, and you can associate together. I'm not talking about being isolated. I'm talking about when your next door neighbor throws a big party and they've got booze flowing freely, you don't go over and join them. <laughs> I found out that there's two, two sacred, two sacred uh, events taking place today that I thought I'd never see. <laughs> funerals where people throw a party and get drunk at funerals. What's the other one? Weddings. <laughs> you know what the big craze is now? Rent a venue that costs you $10,000 or $20,000 and make the wedding real short and then have a party after the wedding so everybody, you got to have a bartender and a DJ and all the worldly music and you got to have a dance. They think. I wouldn't want that at my wedding any more than I'd want somebody getting drunk at my funeral. But they're doing it. When Erica got married, where you at, Erica? There she is. When Erica and Aaron got married here, she had trouble finding a wedding dress because most of them now are very revealing. I mean, and this was a number of years ago. This is like 50 or 100 years ago when she got married. <laughs> and the whole back is cut out of the wedding dress. She was having trouble finding a wedding dress. I mean, it exposed a lot of skin. And now they cut them down. I've seen somewhere it didn't leave much to the imagination at all. I mean, there wasn't enough material there to make a good pair of leggings for a mosquito. And cut out all the way down to where the cheeks of the rear end was showing. I don't care how the styles go. She found a good dress and she had it fixed where it was modest. And I, I still remember that, Erica, and I appreciate it. And Christians who call a Bible-believing church their home ought to have personal standards in their own life. It doesn't mean you're saved or lost. It just means you're living for Christ. Amen. Let me conclude it this way. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, years, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle 
and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, before men, <laughs> that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We don't believe in good works for salvation, but we believe that there are things that we do because we're Christians, because we're saved, because we're going to heaven. We do those things because we want to please Him. Remember that song we sang a little while ago? We want to please Him. Please Him. It's not legalistic. It's not because we're having to follow the commands in order to be saved. It's because we are saved. We want to please Him. Do you love Him? Is your light shining before others? I'm not saying and suggesting that anybody be just weird. I'm just saying we need to be like Christians according to the Bible. Be separated. I think I know the reason a lot of preachers have just stopped preaching on separation at all. It's because they just got tired. They got tired of losing people in their congregation. They got tired of losing offerings in the plate. They got tired of scathing stories from the neighborhood about how legalistic they were. They got tired of seeing the worldly churches grow while theirs shrank. They got tired of having to explain to people on visitation that the stories they have heard about our church is not true. We don't drink chicken blood. You think that's funny, huh? There's stories like that that get told. Preacher just got tired of seeing the worldly churches outperform them. And so then you have big stadiums with a smiling preacher who won't even preach salvation, much less separation. Preachers got tired of preaching it because they got tired of being nailed by parents in their congregation because their teenagers had gotten old enough they wanted to dress their own way and listen to their own kind of music and go to their own kind of activities and they didn't want the preacher interfering with that and the preacher ended up being on the wrong side of the table from the parents. They just got tired and disgusted and discouraged and they decided it's easier just to be like everybody else and not preach it. And so we have in America Laodicea. A Bible-believing church can be a sweet-spirited church. A separated church can be a kind and gracious, amiable type of church. doesn't mean we have to be being spirited at all to be separated. You still are supposed to be nice, but separated. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I know our people love you. And Lord, I pray that we'd express that love by sticking to our standards of holiness, both personally and ecclesiastically. Lord, help us not to think of ourselves as better than anybody. Help us not to make separation a test of salvation or even being right in the heart. But Lord, help us just to want to please you and follow your admonitions in the word. I pray that you'd help us to be separated, soul winning, loving, gracious Christians. Bless our church, we pray. And Lord, if there's somebody that's not saved, I pray they'd trust you tonight. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. If you need to pray,